Hello, my name is Mike Stroh, and we are live at Radio Region Park with the State of Mind podcast, where we create conversations about mental health that change lives. And we try to bring you the stories underneath the slogans. And today, we have a very special guest named Jesse Bigelow. What's up, Jesse? Just chilling, dude. And he is a, a pioneer slash leader slash legend slash general swell guy in the peer uh, support world, peer consumer survivor world. And I'm blessed that he's here. And tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Sure. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, happy to be here. Yeah, I'm basically here to talk about what I've been through. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, where I came from, uh, then talk a little bit about uh, my experiences at the end of high school, which ended up being um, psychosis and addiction, and then maybe talk a little bit about uh, uh, where I went from there and where I'm at now. I had a pretty good childhood. Uh, Growing up, um, I had two loving parents and a sister. Uh, we had a pretty good unit. Um, we were pretty close. Um, I uh, got in a lot of fights with my sister, uh, but I really um, put her on a pedestal, though. Um, you know, she would do something or or uh, choose to eat something, and I would have to do the same thing as her. And then, as a as a child, you know, my, my dad was really great about getting me into sports, uh, educating me about many different sports. My favorite sport of all time is hockey. Big Leafs fan. Uh, super stoked about this season. They're looking great. <laughs> they are. And, uh, yeah. So, yeah, my dad got me into hockey, and he got me into baseball and soccer and football in high school, and uh, I got into a little trouble in the neighborhood playing basketball with some of the boys. I won't, uh, I won't, uh, uh, I won't mention... <laughs> It's okay. Um, I won't mention uh, names, but you know who you are back in the day playing basketball, dude. But, um, yeah, I, so, and the other thing my dad was really good about was he, um, he, he, he would try anything. You know, he was very gregarious like myself. Um, I mean, you know, I know where I got myself from was definitely from my dad, but, um, he would try new things, you know, um, especially like food. Um, he was always, he was very cosmopolitan or, or, or multicultural in, in getting me to try new foods. Like, you know, when I was growing up, you know, it wouldn't, wouldn't be strange for him to bring home like a falafel or like a souvlaki or, you know, um, different ethnic foods. Um, so, you know, w when I was growing up, you know, my, my, uh, my dad and I would go off to play sports or he would bring me to play sports. Uh, and my mom and my sister would go off riding. Uh, my my sister's big love was riding horses, uh, dressage, jump, hunter, jumper. Um, uh, she used to hack, uh, which is like basically riding horses on, on uh, off road terrain. You know, we weren't rich, um, but you know, my dad worked as a uh, Monday to Friday, nine to five, always in a suit, uh, shaving every day, and um, my mom was also working. Um, and, you know, growing up, I w it was, it was, it was a pretty good life. Um, in school, I did, uh, fairly well. Um, in, el in el elementary school, I passed, you know, I wasn't much of a student, like, scholarly or anything in, in elementary or junior high or high school, but, um, uh, I did okay. Uh, I, I, you know, I was kind of average, uh, in my marks. Um, and... Up until probably about grade eleven, uh, you know, you know, I I didn't experience anxiety or 
or um, depression or anything at a young age, like a lot of like a, like some of the people I grew up with. Uh, I, well, I didn't find uh, mental health issues until a little later. So in grade so grade nine and ten, I had good marks. Everything was great. And then grade eleven, uh, I started to do a lot of street drugs. Oh. So I mean, it started with uh, alcohol. Um, and then it quickly moved into uh, uh, marijuana and hashish, and and then it moved into uh, um, acid, magic mushrooms, cocaine, ecstasy, speed. So I was doing a lot of street drugs, and I was kind of partially hanging with the jocks because I played sports, and partially hanging with, um, you know, the druggies. <laughs> the junkies. The yeah, junkies, yeah, exactly. Druggies. druggies, junkies, yeah. Um, depending on which drug, I mean, I guess you could use either term. Yeah, I was spending, you know, half the time with the jocks and half the time with the artists and musicians. That might be a better way to put, like, those people who were using. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, and so, you know, I was bouncing around here and there, and... Um, it was fun for a while, you know what I mean? I remember those days where smoking weed was just, you know, so much fun. And I smoked so much of it. And it seems that we change who we are depending on what type of people we're hanging out with. Yes. So I think a lot of people that end up, you know, using a lot of drugs or having a difficult time with their, I don't know, maybe identity or just trying to figure out who they are, which is a common challenge for young people. We end up almost being like a chameleon, so to speak. So if, if we're hanging out with the jocks, that type of our personality comes out. If we're hanging out with the artsy type, that part of our personality comes out. If we're hanging out with the tough guys or the bat, you know, whatever, then that comes out. And so we, we don't develop a sense of who we are because we're always trying to mirror or fit in with as many people as we can, something like that. Yeah, no, I hear you totally. Um, and I think you're right. You're totally right. Um, but it is a skill in a way because in, in a healthy relationship, like in healthy relationships, um, you, you, it is skill to be able to accept people wherever they're at. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's a big problem about bullying is, you know, people are seen like young people are seen as being overly sensitive or or weak because they are experiencing mental health and addictions issues and they get picked on mm -hmm. um, you know which is it's a sad thing it, when I was growing up uh, I got picked on I was bullied and unfortunately it drove me to become a bully and 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 you know repeat the behaviors so just getting back to, yeah, to you know you. Where, where I was at yeah um, um, so, I... Using lots of street drugs. Yeah, yeah. So, grade so grade 11, and then a couple years went by, and I was just, you know, spending my life uh, in the ravine, <laughs> you know, by my high school smoking and going to house parties and acting the fool, sort of, and... Uh, you know, um, getting into a little bit of trouble along the way. And uh, so around the end of high school, so I barely graduated high school, uh, I got um, my high school diploma at Jarvis. Was that in grade 13, like as an addition, or was it grade 14? No, no, it was, it was my high school diploma. So I, I took a couple of OAC courses, mm -hmm. right? And I just crashed and burned. So I basically settled up, settled for um, a high school diploma. Got it. So in grade 10 Spanish at night school at Jarvis... Um, I barely passed. I got a 52%. 
And I think my teacher gave it to me because she felt sorry for me, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I got my high school diploma and I never looked back. I didn't go to any college or university or anything like that. And what, what were your parents... What was your relationship with your parents through all this? Because I assume since both of your parents are quote unquote your mom's a lawyer right like, she was yeah. she was right yeah. so they're professionals and i assume yeah. they wanted yeah you so to my be... mom was a lawyer and my dad was an architect right. so both did they want you well educated people yeah did right. they pressure you to go to university or were they doing any of that kind of stuff or how was that yeah yeah i mean they wanted me to go to post-secondary but by that time i was so mussed up they would be happy for me to just you know, be well, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, and contribute to society in any way. So at the end of high school, around 19, I'll talk about like the, the hardest time in my life. Sure. Um, so I started to hear voices and experience religious delusions and, uh, and visual, visual and auditory hallucinations um, so one of the first things I experienced was paranoia so I was in the schoolyard and there'd be a group group of students over here talking and laughing and I thought they were laughing at me right mm -hmm. so a slight paranoia but then uh, my illness spiraled into something a lot worse where uh, I started to hear voices and the best way I can explain what it's like to hear voices is when we're thinking our regular thought process, yeah. right? Um, we hear our own voice. So I have that regular thought process, but on top of that, uh, I would hear voices within my mind. So, And um, that were not the same sound as your own. Correct. Right. Yeah. So I would hear voices on top of... Uh, my own voice in my mind, coming from within my mind, mm -hmm. not outside of my mind. Mm -hmm. And um, w it would be a male voice that I believe was the devil and a female voice that I believe was a Virgin Mary. So I started to hear these voices in my mind all day, every day. Now, were you getting high during that time too or no? No, actually, um, there was a time where I got clean from all of the drugs, mm -hmm. or I should say I got sober. Wasn't even drinking alcohol, drinking lots of water, not even drinking caffeine, eating properly, exercising, doing everything right, yep. walking through the park system all day, right? Um, so that had all been... Uh, put in the past at the time. Right. So it was interesting that this came on when I wasn't in a state of psychosis, like what I wasn't using, right? right? It right. was very interesting. And um, so I was hearing these voices, and um, yeah, so they were, hap they were happening all mm -hmm. day long, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I first uh, would reply in my mind mm -hmm. in a talking tone then I replied out loud in a talking tone and then I would yell back at the voices right? mm -hmm. so you see um, everybody or you've seen folks on the street yelling at nothing that's what they're yelling at, their internal stimuli, their auditory hallucinations, their voices. Right. Yeah, that's what's happening there. So, and then, you know, I would also hear other people's thoughts in my mind. And I believe that it was the devil taking their thoughts and putting them in my mind. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, an example of that would be, uh, I would be taking the... Uh, TTC, which I call the totally, totally crappy, <laughs> yeah. right? And uh, uh, I'd be taking the TTC, and there'd be a, a car full of people, mm -hmm. 
and I could hear all of their thoughts in my mind all at the same time. And were they in different sounds? They were in different voices. Yeah. Wow. Voices that I'd never heard before. My brain right. somehow created these voices. Yeah. Because obviously I wasn't actually hearing their mm -hmm. thoughts, mm -hmm. right? right? That's a but that's the healthy explanate mm -hmm. right? the healthy um, stance is that it couldn't be happening. It must have been from my schizophrenia. Right. But at that time, I believed with all my heart that I was listening to everybody's voices. Oh, everybody. Right? Yeah, I think I just want to say uh, something that's quite difficult for people to grasp around somebody in that situation is that to them, it's 100% real. And to everybody else, especially those who aren't familiar or haven't sort of experienced uh, somebody going through that, it's so hard to understand how that can be real for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. because they can't do that, then the empathy goes away and the compassion and all those things sort of disappear. And then it gets into problematic relationships. And then that's where a lot of the pain and the suffering goes on. And I think even in less hard to believe situations, people in general aren't great at acknowledging somebody else's reality yeah. um but and so i it, so yeah, yeah it's hard so, yeah it, it totally and to build on that like um you know this to a healthy mind right is totally illogical doesn't right. make sense you can't even fathom what no. it's like if you yeah. haven't been there yourself right so I, I work in the mental health field we'll talk about that a little later on in the podcast yeah. but um, I've learned, and people in mental health, like people who work in mental health, generally learn that if somebody is experiencing uh, something like this, you don't want to shut the door with the, the rapport and relationship by saying straight out, like, you know, don't, can't you realize that right. this is illogical? <laughs> right. You don't want to do that. Right. But you don't want to go along with it fully either and entertain them and take them down that road. Mm -hmm. So you got to sort of intervene and say listen i understand how real this is for you right mm -hmm. is there any way i can support you what can we do how can we move forward how can i help you work through this and deal with this in a healthy way right know what i'm saying yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's nice so i'm hearing these voices coming at me from everywhere right and you know, a lot of people with psychosis will say they hear, like, a radio dial being turned. Yeah, and, like, they're hearing all these, like, somebody speeding through the radio in their mind. That's right. very common. Yeah. Um, I don't experience that myself. And a lot of other people will hear um, whispers of voices here and there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Not so for me, really. Sometimes I hear the Virgin Mary softly saying something and I'm like, I feel so blessed that I have the Virgin Mary as well as the devil. Right. Right. It, but in this situation, when I was in the street, it, when it was in the totally, totally crappy, mm -hmm. um, I, uh, the scariest thing ever happened to me. The, one of the scariest things I've ever been through is I heard a voice saying in my mind, mm -hmm. kill all of these people and then kill yourself. Yeah which was so scary at the time. I would never follow up on it because I'm loving, I'm caring, I'm positive, so yes. I wouldn't do anything like that. But I heard that, and I understand to a certain degree those young people out there with mental health issues shooting people yeah. and you know, losing it and stabbing someone or whatever. You know, these, these experiences are few and far between for people with my illness. Right. Right? Most of these people will hurt themselves yeah. before they're ever going to hurt anybody else. Right. And you they're also I mean? more likely to be victims of yeah. violence. Yeah. I, I, I think that it would be helpful if we expanded that a little bit because yes. I see all the time whenever when there was the Danforth shooting when and so then the news reports were this person was living with mental illness or whatever. And then 
which I always think if you're at the point where you're willing to kill somebody, you have mental health problems, no doubt about it. And then there's the other side of the picture where I guess some of the advocacy uh, is don't paint people with mental illness as violent, and, which is also true. So there's this weird paradox there where on one side they're saying, you know, these mass murderers or whatever it is uh, are have mental illness. And then the other side saying, well, no, you can't, don't paint everyone who has mental illness, quote unquote, as being violent, which is also true. But there's somewhere in the middle that's not getting acknowledged where it's a lot of these heinous acts, so to speak, um, are, you know, the people are not well. So I don't know how to, how to manage that or bridge that, that situation, but can you share your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, for sure. Like, so the media is a very strong tool, a strong device to educate people and sway people in different ways, yeah. right? That's how we, we receive information and how we have an understanding of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, in the media, it's um, people with schizophrenia or psychosis or people who are unstable or vulnerable people um, get portrayed in a negative light. In a, you know, there was a shooting, for instance. Yeah. How often do you see people with schizophrenia in the media being shown in a positive light, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So... It ha it all it's all about communication. You know right. what I mean? Right. It's all about communication, and it's about I don't want to toot my own horn, yeah. but it's about people coming forth that have the illness, and educating the public, educating families, educating you know people of any different background about what it's really like to have mental health and addictions issues, and to show people that you can contribute in a healthy way back to, to, to society. Um, you can be a positive pillar in the community, mm -hmm. right? Right. You know, just because you have a diagnosis doesn't mean you're destined to, you know, end up shooting somebody right. in later in your life. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to mention, too, is that in, in terms of suicide and in terms of experiencing some of the stuff I've talked about, don't be shy to communicate this to somebody you trust. Because there's always going to be somebody out there that can support you, right? And I'm seeing way more initiatives now, uh, anti-bullying initiatives in, in high schools and, 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 uh, and for students of all different ages. Um, where people are being supported. People are coming forth and sharing what they've been through and getting the right support. I mean, you're doing great work in the, in the, in the school system, right? Mm -hmm. Educating people about mental health and, you know, rather than isolating uh, young people going through this stuff, bringing them in and, and having conversations and, and supporting them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you were talking about being on the subway as yeah. sort of your symptoms yeah. were increasing, I guess. Yeah. And then, so. um, yeah. So with all this happening, I mean, at the time, uh, I, uh, uh had long hair, <laughs> I had a long beard, uh, I was neglecting my hygiene, I was marching up and down the streets preaching join the rich businessman or join the join the rich businessman or join Jesus yeah um, and I uh, somehow had a girlfriend mm -hmm. at the time really really nice young lady and uh, she was Portuguese Catholic and uh, she brought me uh, um, back to her parents apartment and uh, they had religious figurines and 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 signs and and movies and stuff, like Christian based, Catholic based. Yep. And I think she was praying for me the whole time. <laughs> um, and uh, I saw a picture of Jesus Christ on the wall, and I said, "Wow, man, I look like Jesus Christ." Yeah. 
except the picture of Jesus Christ had brown eyes and I had blue eyes. That's the only difference I could see. So I, you know, at that time I thought I looked like Jesus Christ, you know, just a coincidence. But a little later on, I believed I was Jesus Christ, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I got a job at the Dominion. Uh, that's how long ago it was. It was the Dominion. It wasn't Metro. It yeah. was pre-Metro. Okay. And uh, I uh, got a job at the Dominion stocking shelves, right? Mm -hmm. So I believed that as I was touching cans and putting them on the shelf, I was blessing them, right? But then after a while, I said, hmm. I can't bless all of these cans. So I thought that if I touch the can a second time, I'm unblessing it, right? Okay. So it took me the whole night to stock that one shelf. And they fired me that night. Can you believe it? I they can. fired Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the girlfriend, um, I so, guess, yeah, how did that end, so to speak? Um, so we ended up splitting. Right. You know, unfortunately... Um, yeah, okay. um, more after. This. Yeah, we're going to play some. Okay, so if you were with us before, you just heard about Metro for Dominion firing Jesus Christ, which will weigh on their conscience. And I think it's so super cool that like you can finish my phrases now. That's, ah, that's how many like. times you hear me tell that story. Eh? Oh, it's too good. I got Davy Stroh over here giving me big ups for uh, including that story. Okay. So that one's for Davy Boy. Amazing. Um, yeah, it is kind of funny how we get familiar with each other's situations. Um, okay, so Dominion, you're done at Dominion. Yeah. And then so happening? picture this, long hair, long beard, smell like poo and uh just roaming the streets you know mm -hmm. not going anywhere not doing anything um so i was uh i was sick for straight every day probably a couple of years mm -hmm. yeah um and i wasn't using anymore so like it wasn't fueled by drugs at that point right yeah. so yeah, sorry <coughs> excuse me um, so what had to happen was the hospitalization uh, I ended up in hospital um, I ended up in uh, CAMH right and you didn't check yourself in is that right no no uh, so you know with all this happening the voices the, all the, the weird behavior you know thinking I was a prophet Jesus Christ all of this I mean, when when you experience this stuff, it's all in your mind, obviously, right? Yeah. So you can kind of keep a good game face. Um, and people don't know what you're going through. But when you get really ill and you're yelling back at voices and you're, you know, you look like a shabby kind of mm -hmm. street person or, yeah. you know, person who's homeless. Yeah. Um, you know, one yeah. Once you've hit that state, you know, people realize that you have to get help. You know, and I didn't want to because I thought I was a prophet. You know, and yeah. I didn't believe I had a mental health issue. So, uh, my dad had a friend of his uh, come by the house, and he sat with me for about a half hour, and he said, "Yeah, he's most likely got something like schizophrenia. He's experiencing psychosis." Right. Yeah. Sorry, your dad's friend was a doctor. Yeah, he was an MD. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, by the way, yeah, psychosis, if you're not familiar, is a break from reality where you're experiencing something apart from the reality of everybody else. Anyway, so he visited, my dad's buddy, who's an MD, a medical doctor, uh, visited and sat with me and said, yeah, he's probably got psychosis. So he filled out a Form 1, which is a legal document stating that I'd be apprehended, not arrested. Mm -hmm. but apprehended because it was a mental health matter. So arrested is for uh, people committing a crime. Apprehended is for people who are experiencing mental health issues. And so the cops, so, you know, the authorization, authorization was granted that I be um, apprehended by police and taken to the mental hospital, which... Did they, sorry, did they ask you... Did they say, Jesse, we think you should go to the hospital? You said no. I don't recall. There's it was, 
when I was psychotic, there's like f pieces that I remember. Sure. Yeah. And some of it's come back to me, and some of it hasn't. Right. Cool. So, okay. so I'm not sure. Yeah. But uh, so the cops showed up at my door and they put me in the cruiser and handcuffed me, put me in the cruiser and brought me to Cam H at College Street used to be called Clark Institute. They've changed that now because apparently the person who Clark Institute was named after was not so nice of a guy okay. to, to people or sure. patients or clients or whatever. Anyway, so um, I was brought to the 10th floor, the CIU Clinical Investigation Unit, which is now called the EPU, Early Psychosis Unit. Mm -hmm. And um, I was put on the unit. I spent three months on the unit while they tried medications on me. It wasn't so bad. They had a ping pong table and I put the ping pong table up against the wall and I used to bang the ball off the wall and say, off the wall, just like all you crazy buggers in here. <laughs> and, uh, there was a TV in the kitchen room and there was actually a smoking room back then. People, you know, smoking in the, you know, smoking room and uh, I had already quit smoking, so I called it the death room, right? I remember the death room yeah. at North York General. Yeah. Oh, yeah? yeah? Yeah. The death room. The death room. <laughs> okay, sorry. So you're in there? Yeah. And yep. then, you know, I met a lot of interesting folks. You met, you meet a lot of interesting characters in psych wars, man. And uh, Anyway, so I was discharged Christmas Eve uh, 1999. And uh, to my parents, and I was still ill. Had to go back in for a few weeks in January of 2000, and then I got out and eventually um, found the right antipsychotic for me. I knew it was for me, uh, you know, in hindsight because after a couple of weeks of using it, all my voices disappeared, and that's how I knew. That's the one thing that gave me insight so insight is a very important word uh, describing that you can see clearly that you have a mental health or addiction issue so that fact of my voice is going away that gave me insight into saying that I have schizophrenia you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time I was uh, developing schizophrenia or yeah, moving through that, the psychosis, in a healthy way, I became a Christian. I became a believer of Jesus Christ. And I believe to this day, with all my heart, that there is a Jesus Christ. Um, I don't think that you're wrong if you believe in God and it isn't Jesus Christ. Yeah. But for me, that's how I started to believe. Sure. So there's this duality of I have a mental health issue that's derp dopamine neur neurotransmitters firing in my brain that causes me to have psychosis and hear voices. And there's a faith side of me that, you know, I, I have a belief that there's something greater around us, within us, right? So right. And you, as you say, it doesn't matter sort of what that experience is connected to in terms of a faith or a god or a whatnot, but it's there and it's a healthy or it can be quite a healthy healing part of your of someone's life. So for sure. Good. I mean faith can be huge for people in recovery. Yeah. So recovery is a word that uh, that is used for once you've recognized you're ill, you're you you've come to a place where you're um, treating your illness in a healthy way and moving forward, you've gained insight and recovery comes after that. And that's when your true spiritual and healthy life begins. Right. And recovery means different things to different people. You know what I mean? Like, I know some people that would say, if you're still drinking alcohol, for instance, then you're not really in recovery. Mm -hmm right um, you know but I think as addicts um, there's always something that you need to fill that void with when you when you stop having some behaviors right uh, but 
anyway, we, we, we don't have to get caught up. <laughs> but, um, well, can you explain, so one thing in talking earlier, and this is something I think that is, when being around you, and when I see you interact with other people, there's, you have this, you know, you're a human, so it's not 100% of the time. I am a human being. I'm yeah. not a robot, I assure you. <laughs> no, but you have this sort of glow of love and kindness and sort of openness to people, which is really lovely. Uh, can you talk about how, I guess, maybe whether it's faith or just whatever, how that's part of your recovery, or maybe that's part of you showing what is possible, or I don't know, it's something that's nice and you recognize that as part of your well-being. Uh, can you tell us, I guess, about how what love means or how you embody that and how it helps you in your daily life? Thank you for bringing that up. That's uh -huh. a perfect segue in what I wanted to talk about. Actually. So, <laughs> Great. Um, I think that love is the most important word or concept there is. Uh -huh. And if you have love for God, yourself, and others, then it doesn't matter all these written religions. It doesn't matter what name you use for God. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a huge part of recovery is having that feeling that we're all connected some ways and there is a higher power um, working in us and through us and that we are treating our brothers and sisters with respect and dignity and love. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that must have had, but you. I assume that had to start with applying that to yourself. Oh, so, for sure. So for as sure. you got into recovery, you said you sort of found Christianity. Yeah. Was I, that a process of of applying that to yourself? For sure. Yeah. For sure. It was the rigorous honesty, <laughs> right? Um, it was. Moving through being a guy who was getting into fights, stealing money off my mom, uh, lying to people, being selfish and thinking of only of myself, mm -hmm. turning that into somebody that loves himself, gives back to the community, supports people when they need it. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It was yeah. a tough thing to turn it around, to flip it. But actually, one of my favorite rappers, KRS-One, was a huge uh, influence on me becoming a pillar in the community. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I, but it wasn't easy. It wasn't overnight. It was real work. No kidding. Right? I, I, so, yeah. Alchemy. And then, yeah. So, so just to finish, uh, just to move through what, what I was talking yeah. about, where I was at and where I was going. Um, so basically, you know, I found the right antipsychotic. I was not using anything, um, and uh, I got well. And I got a job as a peer support worker. So for those who don't know, peer support worker is somebody who has mental health and addictions issues that works in the community, in the mental health community, with people who. Um, our clients or patients or members or basically just people in the community or peers. Right. Peers is another term. Um, and so I luckily, or I shouldn't say luckily, I put in the work, yep. so it wasn't luck, that um, I did a lot of... So in my recovery, I did a lot of public speaking. I've been connected with various different organizations such as the Schizophrenia Society of Ontario and uh, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. And um, the big one, or one of the big ones for me, was Canadian Mental Health York Region. I got a job in 2007 on an early intervention team called the HOPE Team, Help Overcome Psychosis Early. Big up to anybody who knows uh, anybody from there. Um, so I, I did that. So I was at... Uh, I started that in 2007, mm -hmm. and I worked there till 2015, uh, working yeah. with young people experiencing psychosis. Like, and I saw a lot of the same behaviors that I was exhibiting when I when I was going through psychosis. Yeah. So basically, I was working with young people experiencing psychosis for the first time, 
and it was huge. It was huge. It was a big accolade for me to able for me to be able to do that, right? And you know, it was a lot of it was just like you know running informal peer support groups and uh, playing pool. We had a pool table, so you know the, ping pong. No ping pong. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pool table. Yeah. And um, some of the best conversations came out of just shooting the breeze, mm -hmm. hanging out at the pool table, shooting pool. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Like to support young people, it's huge to do fun stuff, you know what I mean, and provide like a space, like a fun space where you can open up and start talking about things if it's difficult for that person, right. or for young people. Yeah. So I moved through that, and then uh, I, uh, and all this time I was, uh, like I said, I was doing a lot of public speaking, like I spoke at U of T uh, for first year, to first year med students several years in a row, spoke to colleges spoke to MPPs, basically spoke to anybody who would listen to me, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and um, I, uh, um, yeah, so I moved through CMHA, and then I worked at CAMH, uh, taking OPOC surveys, Ontario Perceptions of Care surveys, um, to, uh, to residents and, and patients and clients you know there's always yeah. different words um to uh people on the units at CAMH to find out like what do they need what's working what are the challenges like how can we move forward and then uh after that I ended up um working uh with homeless people in Regent Park cool just uh you know. yeah literally just down the street from where we are here yeah. at Radio Regent um yeah. what about uh BTCN, Beyond the Cuckoo's Nest at CAMH, because you've been a part of that for a long time, and that's, you know, my brother and I are now speaking there, and a huge part of Starts With Me and this podcast, as I mentioned in the beginning, is because of us becoming involved there. Um, so, yeah, maybe, I mean, you must have, over the years, spoken to, well, not just at BTCN, but in general, thousands and thousands of people. Um, so... Yeah, what was it? How was your experience with BTCN, and how was that sort of helped frame everything you do? So BTCN was uh, one of my favorite uh, um, formats for speaking, uh, speaking, and perfect age to speak to people about mental health and addictions issues. Um, high school students, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, I, uh, I think it was huge. It was huge. Like that's when I was around the same time I started to speak out. Right. Was BTCN and um, that was back in oh my god, um, I think oh five. So it was before you got uh, started working at, at CMHA. Yeah, wow, amazing. It was it was a couple of years before, and that was part of my resume to to get the job at CMHA. <laughs> Right. Yeah. yeah. So, can you? Uh, so we we can go over time a little bit, but uh, will you? Can you tell us the your two stories of being in recovery with your girlfriends? <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. Man. Okay, great. Let's hear it. Let's Dave, hear it. Davey boy likes this one too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's hear it. All right. So um, when you have schizophrenia, by the way, schizophrenia is a combination of two Greek words, schizo and phren, which means split mind. But don't get it twisted. Schizophrenia is not split personality or multiple personality disorder. Right. That's an often it's, a big misconception. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. It's it's um, yeah. It's not that. It's yeah. uh, schizophrenia. And one in a hundred people worldwide experience schizophrenia themselves. So one percent of the population worldwide will have schizophrenia in their lifetime. Just throwing that out there before I tell you that schizophrenia, um, you know, is not always such a big bad word. And an example of it not being a big bad word is, I mean, I had a couple of girlfriends what, since I had. Uh, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and one of them, uh, I, and you, you know, you don't like, 
share right off the bat when you're dating somebody that you have schizophrenia like that's not the particular time because you never get a date right right but, um so uh i remember it was time i was dating this one woman for i don't know a couple of years or whatever and i decided that it was time to share with her that i had schizophrenia so i sat her down and i said um, baby i got something to tell you and she goes, oh, no, what? I sit her down and I say, baby, I have schizophrenia. And she says, is that it? I thought you were going to tell me you're married. <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> oh. And so then that just went over. So then, whenever. yeah, it wasn't a big thing. You know I mean, I have schizophrenia, big deal. I'm, st I'm like, there's so much else to me than having the diagnosis of schizophrenia you know what i'm saying like i do yoga i play poker i play golf i like massages i like pedicures <laughs> I, I, was, I was admiring your lovely yeah. nails <laughs> <laughs> um there's so much more to me than than uh i'm a brother i'm a right. son i'm a you know, teammate, I'm a work, uh, a co-worker, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, there's so much more than just the diagnosis. Yeah. The next one up, this was more recent, and uh, I got more bold, so I <laughs> it was less time until I just divulged the information. So right. this next one, I... Uh, um, uh, it's time for the talk. Yeah. Oh. Are you forgetting? I could probably tell it, actually. Okay, why don't you tell it? Okay, so, uh, you know, it was time for the talk, and so I, I, sit, I sit her down, and I say, baby, I got, got something, something to, to tell, tell you. you. And she says, oh, no, what? What is it? And you say, baby, I have schizophrenia. And she goes, oh, I know. I Googled you after the second date. <laughs> How was that delivery? Was that okay? Uh, that was good. That man. was not bad. Holy jeez. That was not bad. Passing the torch here, man. <laughs> People so are going to start telling my story for me, they man. Are. <laughs> I actually, you know, learning from you and other people's experience has helped me a lot in education environments or when people ask questions. Yeah. Yeah. It's really nice to know, or at least to be able to reference people's experience as as sort of valid and i guess um clearly the reality of the situation for a lot of people i think i don't know it seems there's not many people out there talking about this stuff openly it's it's anyway which is maybe why we're here doing it yeah. uh, for one thing and uh, something yeah. that randomly came to my mind is mm -hmm. like um little like hints of if if you're out there and you want to speak in public is, uh, you know, always have somebody in the audience that, you know, you're comfortable with. And, you know, when somebody, you know, says something previously, um, in, in a, in a, say in a, um, workshop type way, you know, like saying, as so-and-so said, like bringing up people's right. names, like people feel really good when you do that type of stuff. Right on. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about your support network? And because I think, oh, yeah. Good. yeah, it's really helpful for people to understand the diversity of ways that we can help ourselves or that people get support. Because sometimes people think, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. No one's going to help me, da, 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 uh, which certainly when you're isolated and scared and whatnot that's a real valid experience but you know wh the better we can help people move from that to asking for help or to whatever it is so can you tell us a bit about you know yeah. what what has been yeah part of your i think first and foremost like <clears throat> if you're supporting somebody and just listening is the, the biggest support you can offer like you don't have to save the world. You don't have to, you know, even know how to get somebody to help. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and if you're yourself, if yourself, if you're going through something, 
identify uh, you know who's your best support like who who do you really trust who are you gonna go to, forward to with what you're going through and family isn't necessarily uh, your given family you know you're free to create your family if needed right you know what I'm saying and you know there's a lot of resources out there now too you know what I mean hospital is one option if you are experiencing crisis yep but there's a lot of supporting organizations out there as well and you know maybe doing your research um, one thing that has been huge to keep me connected to the mental health community is the consumer survivor info bulletin which is uh, put out by Sound Times now. It used to be KMH, but now it's put out by Sound Times. Cool. Um, yeah, and it's all it all comes back to communication, I think. Cool. Can you, and then, so what about, talk to us about the app that you recently helped develop. Yeah, okay. And that was about, about your slip gear that you're wearing. Oh, yeah, okay. Um... So the A4I, is it? Yeah, yeah. So um, Ken H created an app called A4I, App for Independence for People with Psychosis. Mm -hmm. I believe it's the first thing of its kind. Um, it's going through some beta testing s stages. Um, so it will be out uh, to the public at some point. Um, I was recently... Um, uh, uh, recently, uh, Cam H uh, sent me down to Boston to discuss it in a uh, tech um, gathering, I guess. Conference. Conference, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it was a super good experience. And uh, yeah, that you know, I guess that's the way of the world. You know what I mean? We're we're looking to apps to do a lot of our connection and supporting and everything and yeah do you think i often have a hard time with this the the i don't know if it was kids help phone or some kids help phone i think was part of it but there was recently a huge national launch of a texting service for kids in crisis and i often i have a hard time balancing between meeting people where they're at which then you know kids are on tech and they're on their phones and whatever so that is a good thing to meet them there but what I think all of us can agree on to some extent is the world is desperately lacking connection and human to human interaction so the more we sort of create platforms that are tech tech based the less we have this human interaction which again I don't know it's sort of meeting people where they're at but at the same time People don't need more tech. They need more people. They need more human experience. So I don't know what your thoughts on are on that. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, yeah. So just to finish. Sure. We can go over a little bit. But why don't you talk about your slick gear? Okay. So I got uh, my best friend, Dave. In the studio with us today, as you, as I alluded to earlier, mm -hmm. and uh, he's got this uh, super cool sort of uh, swag. 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 Not the swag, no. but the swag. 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 Anyway, swag. okay. Yeah. Swag. <laughs> and uh, um, it's going to be at some point. Mm -hmm. Uh, post, posted on the startswithme.ca website. Yes. And uh, it's pretty cool. It uh, The way it looks like, I have a t-shirt and a hat. And uh, <laughs> uh, the way it looks like, is it looks like a rectangle. Yep. But it's not just any old rectangle. It's officially the dimensions of pi. Mm-hmm versus one all right and that's what makes it so special so for y'all don't know what pi is that's <laughs> 3.14 to one those are the dimensions 
and my buddy did so crazy cool he came up with it <laughs> so keep your eyes posted for this in the future very good um okay everybody thank you jesse thank yeah. you very much yeah, no uh, problem. Glad, glad to be here man awesome and so if anybody out there has any questions you can go to startwithme.ca and contact us there we're always uh, open to supporting people or answering questions that we are capable of answering and anyhow uh thank you for listening let us know if you want to hear about any particular topics too that's another thing that we need to get better at asking for and that's about it